Um, and you can pick, the, you can see that wherever you get podcasts, or I think it's on YouTube as well. Uh, so check that out and uh, support them. And so with that, on with the show. All right, so here's a, here's a big old map of Africa. Um, where we're heading is down here, Namibia and Botswana. Namibia's got kind of a unique geographic features in that it's, it borders five countries, Angola, Zambia, um, Zimbabwe, uh, Botswana, of course, and, and South Africa. And then to the east is the Atlantic Ocean. It's the driest of all the sub-Saharan uh, African countries. So let's see here. And so here's kind of a, a close up. Um, well, I should, I'm gonna go one more. This uh, shows you the desert. This is uh, the Kalahari in the kind of orange brownish stuff. And then the Namib desert, which runs along the coast. And we'll go back to here. So our trip starts in the capital of Namibia called Windhoek or Windhoek. And we fly in there from Johannesburg typically. And this is the route that we take. We, uh, we cross the desert to the coast to Walvis Bay and um, Swapkuk Mund. And then we kind of head up, making our way to, uh, to the edge of the Namib Desert, on up to Etosha, and then up to this very strange part of their geography, the Caprivi Strip, and then down into the Okavanga Delta. So this is uh, approximately about 1,500 miles or so. It's like a crazy long trip. And if you ever were to tell someone beforehand, they go, well, you'd, you'd be in the car all day. Uh, but the cool thing about traveling in the desert that all, is all the roads are straight. <laughs> You're not bending around. It's just A to B to C, and you can go quite quickly. So <clears throat> start in uh, Vinduk, as I said, it's got a population of 430,000, by far the largest city in um, Namibia. Uh, the country itself is 15% uh, larger than Texas, but by population, it's um, at uh, 2,700,000 is approximately 10 times less than Texas. So it's the second lowest population density of any country after Mongolia. And to me, that's a, a huge draw. We start off in... Um, in the uh, highlands right outside of uh, Vintook. Uh, it's basic scrub uh, habitat. And we start picking up uh, birds right away. Uh, one of the early ones would be Montero's hornbill. And that was taken uh, digiscoping. And here's a uh, red-billed Franklin. Lots of game birds there. Uh, this is, used to be called African red-eyed bulbul. Now it's called black-fronted bulbul. I like the former name better. And this is acacia pied barbet. It's pretty widespread. We see it in a lot of places. Here's a chickadee relative called the ashy tit. And I think this is one of Jim Brown's. He probably got the best shot of this bird. Um, crimson breasted gonalic. It's a type of bush shrike. It's also uh, the Namibian national bird. Really handsome. And we probably would get introduced to this bird. It's a type of taraco called the gray go away bird. And it's called the go away bird because of its voice. Go away, go away, go away it seems to say. And this is uh, one of Jim Brown's really cool shots. Uh, these are a couple of whiteback mouse birds. Uh, of course, we're in the desert, so every little drip of water is, is extremely valuable. There's a little leaky faucet here, leaky pipe. 
with a uh, Cape glossy starling looking on. The mouse birds are unique in that they have uh, four forward facing toes. And this can make for uh, comical viewing when they're in trees, sometimes they just fall right over because they don't have the balance. <clears throat> and what would uh, any birding trip without a visit, uh, visit to the sewage works? This is the Gammons Water Care Works. And of course, sewage treatment centers are magnets for birds, especially in the desert. Here's a South African shell duck and Cape teal, little grebe and squawk o'heron in the reeds next to it. Here's a bird that can be found in, um, in dry habitat as well as near water. This is black-headed heron. And there's African darter, uh, a relative of Anhinga. Cormorants, this, is, uh, this one's called reed cormorant. Uh, actually, the name's been changed to long-tailed cormorant. Uh, it's one of the smallest. And then one of the larger cormorants is a uh, great cormorant. Believe it or not, this is a subspecies of our own great cormorants that we see here in Connecticut in the wintertime on the Connecticut River. And uh, they're a larger cormorant, but nothing next to this great white pelican, the largest pelican in the world. What a monster. And this is uh, one cool bird, family of one, called a hammer cop, um, like a hammerhead. Cop in Afrikaans is head, old hammerhead. And these are kind of a heron-like bird, but they're just in their own, uh, on their own family, monotypic. So heading next, we will be going to, um, we're going out of Windhoek and we're going to cross over to the Atlantic coast. Uh, there's a big highway that you can go and probably make it in two or three hours, but we prefer to take the slow dirt road uh, where the birding is great. And instead of like three hours, it's going to take us probably like 12. <laughs> but it's well worth it. Here's a, an example of the habitat. And here's uh, Rufus Crown uh, Roller, used to be called Purple Roller, and the most photographed bird in probably all sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, the Lilac Breasted Roller. Ooh, everybody got pictures of this bird. Uh, we get introduced to our first antelope. This is a kudu. Uh, note the twisted horns and the kind of brown inner ear. Um, very, uh, one of the larger antelopes. There's crowned lapwing. And southern pale chanted goshawk. Southern, southern pale chanting goshawk, S-P-C-G for short. It's probably the most widespread, the most common of all the birds of prey on this trip. Here's greater kestrel, um, just about twice the size of our American kestrel. This Eastern bluebird lookalike is short-toed rock thrush. It's really cool little thrush. And here's Johnny Hangman or the butcher bird. <laughs> otherwise known as common fiscal. It's called those names because of its habit of impaling its prey on fence, on fence and um, acacia plants like these. Ah, some trips, and I know, I think the very first one, we, we had tons of these pearl spotted owlets. Then on subsequent trips, we'd have, we'd have a few. It was up and down. Um, here's a, a quick little film where I'm whistling to get its attention. I 
think I hear Jana in the background. And here is um, a, another bush shrike. Uh, this is called brown crowned chagra, chagra spelled with a T, T-C-H. And we get some of the hornbills, this is African gray hornbill, yellow billed hornbill. Interesting thing about hornbills is their um, nesting strategy. All hornbills are cavity nesters. And what happens is the, uh, the female is the sole incubator of the eggs. So what she does is she goes into the hole and she essentially seals herself off and builds like a, um, like a wall in the hole uh, using feces, um, maybe mud from the female or um, things that are in the nest. But so she seals herself in with just a little feeding slot so that the male can come and feed her. But then she's imprisoned in there for the entire maybe 25 or 30 days until the eggs hatch. And at a certain point after that, she'll break out and the young will rebuild or reseal the nest cavity with the little opening. So that she, she breaks out so that she and the male can uh, provide the food for the young. It's a very cool nesting strategy. And a little later in the afternoon, our eyes are peeled for Rupel's Koran or Rupel's Buster. Uh, Koran is an Afrikaans uh, word that means crying hen. But this one didn't sound too much like a crying hen. Listen, another one we'll call in the background. I love that move. <laughs> All right. So we're still heading towards the coast. If we play our cards right and kind of stretch it out long enough and the sun, sun starts to set. We uh, bump into nocturnal uh, mammals like this bat-eared fox. And here's another one of Jim Brown's cool shots from a big distance away, African wildcat. We actually had one of those um, on a subsequent trip in a outhouse in Atosha. We opened the door to the outhouse and there was an African wildcat um, uh, sleeping, so nobody got to go to the bathroom. This is uh, one that uh, the early travelers uh, didn't know about. This is a, um, one of the most primitive plants on earth. It's called a Welwichia, and it's a, uh, basically a, a ground conifer that can live anywhere from between a thousand and two thousand years. It's a um, a, a family of one, and amazingly, it's only found in the Namib Desert, which sometimes has absolutely no rainfall. So how does it get its green and, and leaves and so forth? It's, it's from the fog that drifts in off the Atlantic Ocean. Awesome plant. So <clears throat> here we are at the coast, and the neat as a pin little Swap Cup Mund, which is an old German city with really attractive um, architecture. Here's our hotel for a couple nights. The Ebervine, which is a former private re residence turned into a hotel. Great food in, uh, in this town. Um, this fantastic fish, best fish ever. It's called King Clip and people would have it, you know, both nights that we were there. Uh, but we had to get up early the next morning to hit the dunes. And here's, you guys remember this church on the middle of nowhere. Those of you who are on the trip, still there. Oh, as if we had to be told. 
And this was from 2010, a, a black chested snake eagle, right at dawn on the dunes. We had come to this area looking very specifically for um, a bird called the dune lark. And that's in these dune fields. This is, I think, from 2010, if I'm not mistaken. There's Margie. And there he is, the dune lark. Sometimes it, well, the worst case scenario took us a couple of hours to find. I think maybe in that 2010. It's amazing that this bird can even exist here. It also gets its water from the fog drifting in from the Atlantic and from the moisture and spiders and other insects. And it's the only true Namibian endemic. There are many, many, many Southern African endemics, but only one that's confined to the border and only in the Namib desert. Then it's on to the shore. This is the big salt works. Salt production is a huge part of the economy in Walvis Bay. Uh, so pretty cool processes. And here's some greater flamingos and lesser flamingos. Greater is on the right, um, whiter, and the lesser flam uh, flamingo is pink, more pink, and with a dark bill. A couple of graders here. And here are um, same species that we occasionally get in Connecticut, uh, eared grebes. This is white fronted uh, plover and chestnut collared plover. And three waders. This is a black winged stilt and pied avocet and common green shank, all feeding in the shallows. So we're on our way out of Walvis Bay after just two nights. And we're, our next stop is gonna be the town of Omaruru near the edge of the desert, as the edge of the uh, Namib that is. Here's the guest house that we stayed at several years in a row um, in town, bumped into these ladies. And for just a few rand, I was able to, uh, snap their picture. These are our Herrero in the traditional garb, kind of a colonial deal with these wild hats. And so Omaruru is a town that's kind of split in two by a dry riverbed. And uh, one of the riverbed, a dry riverbed specialists is this uh, hornbill called Demera red hornbill. Another bird we look for there is Southern Pied Babbler, a spiffy bird. And a bird that's found really all over the uh, country is African Hoopoe. I think it's still called officially Eurasian Hoopoe. They really haven't split it yet. Um, this is a bird we've seen almost every time. Um, at this location, and this is Faroe's eagle owl, and um, used to be called giant eagle owl. And note the pink eyelids, very unique, really cool bird. Uh, one year, I think it might have been 2010, uh, we had a barn owl that was roosting uh, in some bamboo right next to the guest house. He came out at night for a show. Barn owl, by the way, same as ours, one of the most widespread owls in the world. And from there, we, we go just a short distance, maybe even 45 minutes to our next lodge, um, which is at the true edge of the Namib Desert and the Kalahari uh, with this characteristic really rocky outcrops. This is called Irongo Lodge. And this was kind of most people's favorite lodge on the trip. Unfortunately, I've heard that they've gone out of business this year with the, because of the pandemic. 
very sad, but um, the accommodations were super spacious. If you note the, here's the bathroom back here, there's stone. And then the back of it is actually the mountain, the back wall. What a cool place to stay. Yeah, there's another shot from the front. Ah, Rock Hyrax, closest relative is the elephant. Um, they call them dassies and uh, they just sit around and sun themselves quite cool in the morning. You know, I don't think I mentioned, but this was the, this is South Africa, uh, Southern African winter. So it's quite um, cool at night and warm during the day, but dry, dry, dry. <clears throat> this is Slender Mongoose. Well, we bumped into this maybe once or twice uh, on these trips. Cool mammal. And this is Namibian rock agama, a type of lizard. And this is a sand lizard. Uh, so they throw corn out right under the dining room and, and this bird will come in to feed on it. Green winged pytelia, absolutely stunner. Love that red eye. And here are the lovebirds that come in. We get, oh uh, boy, 30 or 40 will come in right at uh, just before breakfast for us. Uh, rosy faced lovebirds. Uh, Cape glossy starling, really spiff. And carp's tit. This is one of my favorite, um, favorite birds, the rock runner really like that bird it has a very cool song too so uh, but our main target our reason for going there for the most part our birding reason for going there is is this bird it's very localized it's called the heart lobs franklin and so that's the main guy that we we want to get when we uh, visit orongo now everybody you know we only stay there two nights and people are like, how come we can't stay here longer? This is so cool. You know, it really is a beautiful place. Makes you want to just kind of meditate or write poetry or something. And, uh, but uh, we have, must press on. And I always feel good about, you know, I feel bad that everybody wants to stay, but guess what? We're heading to Itosha, which is one of the great, parks in the world. So here's a, I'll just use my little pointer. We're gonna run up over here and we wind up going in uh, in the Western part of the park. Itosha is, um, is about the size of Connecticut. And here's, here's where we come in the Anderson Gate. So it's size of Connecticut has a famous Itosha plain. Uh, it's just, absolutely the coolest place to visit. Um, and amazingly, I think in 2010, we ran into zero um, uh, Americans. Um, it's really not known by a lot of people, but the Africans, you know, uh, who come from South Africa, they've got plenty of parks, but they, they come to Atosha. Atosha is just, just the coolest. And here are the three main lodges that we stay in. This is called Okakweo. This one's called Halali at the midpoint, and then Namatoni at the end. And in between, you, you spend your time running around to these various water halls, these little blue dots. And at the water halls, there's always action. So you just cruise around looking for stuff. And no, uh, I think in 2010, as a matter of fact, we had just entered the park and just were on our way to the first lodge. Uh, here's, here's some of the stuff that, you know, don't get out of the car, don't feed the animals, uh, don't get on top of the car, be out by uh, sunset. <clears throat> Beware of rhino and son of a gun, we had a rhino almost the first thing 
coming into the park. This is black rhino. It's one of the rare, most endangered mammals on earth and super spectacular. It's got that pointy snout. They've taken to uh, chopping the, the horns off because of the poaching. They've had a, a poaching problem of late. So they try to make it less enticing um, for the poachers. But black rhino, wow. Best place on earth to see them. Uh, here's a shot of the pan with the giraffes and an ostrich. And there's the pan. Boy, kind of it kind of reminds me of those the old Bob Hope um, movies where they're they're out in the desert and they see water. It looks like water in the distance, but it's really only sand. Oh, Bing Crosby and uh, Bob Hope, but uh, just wild looking. Here's some uh, an array of mammals at a water hole, <clears throat> including oryx and giraffe. Uh, there's some springbok in the background, ostrich. Um, this is called uh, Namaqua sand grouse. They, you go to see them in the early morning and the evenings at, at uh, water holes. Um, they come in and, and get their water for the day and take off, but you got to get there early to see them. Here's another one. This is virtual sand grouse, much more uncommon. Of course, elephants, a great park to see elephants, always a thrill. There's one with a, uh, a youngster. More corons, that is the smaller busters. This is red crested uh, coron, um, not really showing its red crest. It only shows that when it's in breeding. And again, this is winter. They're not breeding at this point. You know, little chevrons on the back, uh, northern black coron. I think it's now called white quilled coron. A stunning bird. And here's the world's heaviest flying bird, Cory Bustard. Ooh, uh, favorite of many. One of the trips we did, we, we had a little contest to see how many Cory Busters we could see in one day. And I think we hit over 40 on our, um, in a tow ship. So they're around, they're mostly walking. You don't see them flying all that much, but they do fly. This is Rufus Eared Warbler. Now, most of the old world warblers aren't all that much to look at, but this one is mighty colorful and, and handsome, with a very long tail. This is one of the old uh, digiscoping through the scope, uh, uh, spike-heeled lark. Lots of larks and pipits. I'm going to spare you a lot of them tonight, though. This is double banded courser, real dry area type of almost like a, um, a waiter. And this is Birchall's courser with the, uh, the adult on the right and youngster on the left. And you just run into these while you're driving along. Of course, you're not allowed out of the vehicle. So all of the, when you're in Atosha, you just got to do it from the vehicle. And it, it sounds like a drag, but it isn't. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, this is Spotted Thick Knee. And I would say in only about 50% of the trips did we see this. This is a, um, a, a dry country thick knee. There's another one called Water Thick Knee that is quite a bit easier to see. And this is Southern Reebok, a female, lots of um, antelope. I, I think we get around 20 species of antelope on this trip. Here's Impala and Red Heart Beast, kind of evil looking beast. And wildebeest, as well as Oryx and uh, Springbok. And here's one of the smallest. This is Damara Dick Dick. Love that name, Damara Dick Dick. Cute little deer like antelope. 
And the largest of them is Eland. This is like the, the size of a large steer. Ah, so this is, uh, Dennis was using this as in the promo. This was from 2010. We never really duplicated um, this. This is at Okaquea. We had been, we had spent the entire morning out looking at mammals and birds and so forth. And all the mammals seemed to be walking towards our camp. And so we got back at around 1 p.m. And this is what we saw. There's over 2000 animals. It just was incredible. And of course, this is our first full day at Okaquea. And I walked up and I went, oh, it's like freaking Woodstock, man. And oh my God, the Germans that were sitting there watching, they, they turned to me, shh, 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 shh. You know, it was like verboten, you know, talk or anything like that. Of course, they didn't, the animals didn't care. But wow, what a mind blower. I just took that with a you know cheap point and shoot. Um, unbelievable. Um, in a short while into this, we were eat our, eating our lunch and watching the action. And then off in the distance, shot that through the scope, uh, this herd of elephants came. And by the time that they made it, and you notice everyone's gone. This is like 15 minutes after that uh, point and shoot shot with the 2000 animals. They just cleared everybody out. There's a, you ever think about how a giraffe has to drink? How does he get down low enough? Boy, this is, uh, it's pretty tricky. You gotta spread it all out there. And also it puts them in a quite vulnerable position. I remember one night at Okaquea, so you go there and sit and there's a fence separating you. And there was a, a giraffe determined to take a drink and this went on for at least a couple hours. He'd be looking around because there were a couple lions nearby and we had, we had seen them. And so finally he just was so, so thirsty that he just went ahead and did this, only it was at night. And um, amazingly, the lions couldn't care less. They must have already eaten, but he was, he was on high alert. So no shortage of uh, scavengers. This is the uh, largest of the vultures, lapid faced vultures, super powerful bill. Uh, usually the first to show up at a kill, they can crack the bones, start the thing rolling for all the smaller uh, scavengers. And then sometimes they'll show up at the very end when there's nothing left. And the shot of choking down the tail of a wildebeest, ow. Nothing is left to waste. There's a black back jackal, another scavenger. Ah, ooh, spotted hyena. These are, these are, this is one tough animal. And there are many hyena stories over the years. One, uh, one year we had a hyena. Um, they're not supposed to like water. Well, we saw one diving repeatedly because he had chased a, um, some kind of antelope into a watering hole and he didn't want to let it get away. So he went in the water and would take a chunk out of the hyena and then surface and then dive again and surface. And it's just wild. And this, this guy has a lot of blood on him. Super successful predator. There's Swainson's Franklin, really sharp looking guy with a, with a darker bill and the red face. This is uh, uh, African pygmy uh, falcon. I think it's one of the smallest, maybe smallest or second smallest in the world, um, smaller than a robin. There's a very large Marshall Eagle pair it, uh, just sitting near a uh, watering hole. All this stuff's going on inside of Atosha. Uh, the secretary birds, kind of a um, bird of prey, but ground bird of prey. And they spend their time walking around and grabbing snakes and lizards and things. A spectacular bird. 
It was Af African uh, white scop, uh, white scopsal, white faced scopsal rather, uh, African scopsal, blending right in with the the tree behind it. Um, not always, but every once in a while we would uh, run into uh, cheetah, and this is. Uh, this is one fortunate shot. Um, uh, mother with three young. Note that, you know, the, the shape of the spots there. And uh, of course, everyone who comes to Africa, you want to see lion. Um, that's, you know, number one on the list for just about every first time visitor to any African country, Sub-Saharan African. There's a young male and a female and a female with three young. And there's the adult male, nasty looking guy. And actually we have, I have a little uh, video that Charlie shot um, at this watering hole, um, which we visit every time. I forget the name of the watering hole, but there were these three, um, Warthogs, let's call them Mo, Larry, and Curly. Keep, keep an eye on these guys, and um, especially Curly on the right. That's Janet talking. <laughs> that was Margie. So this took quite a while before the warthog uh, expired and the male brought him over to this tree, put him down and just fell asleep. He was tired out from the struggle, but nobody, including the female and the three young went near the male. The male would get the first, uh, first pickings. They, so they had to settle just for some water. <laughs> Uh, uh, here's here's a big target for the trip. This is leopard. Note the, uh, the spots there, the two tone spots. Here's a um, a young one. Came right up to the vehicle, and just was just acting like a house cat. This was uh, from 2011. Uh, the one Jana was on. Uh, it was. Um, we hadn't had a uh, leopard um, in 2010, and this was 2011, in the last half hour of the last day in the tow ship. So our last chance, and we scored the one in the tree. Wow, I bet Jenna remembers that. So from Etosha, we are now going to the Caprivi Strip, this odd, little geographic feature of old German route that um, is still part of Namibia. So we're going to a place called Chamvera Lodge, but en route, the guides are saying, okay, now you're in the real Africa. And so you really see these little extended family villages, thatched roofs, just adorable kids carrying the thatch. Thatch is a really big thing. They're always repairing the roofs those kind of things and they get their little lunch bowls and so forth, really cool. Uh, so we get to Shambara, it's um, on the Kavango River, which then would become the Okavango River eventually when it gets into Botswana. Lots of birds on the property right there. This is uh, violet back starling, absolutely stunning. 
and white helmet shrike with the yellow wattled eye there. Very cool bird, another one of those um, shrike relatives. Uh, Red-billed firefinch, violet-eared um, finch, uh, violet-eared waxbill, sorry. And blue waxbill, violet-eared waxbill, a little water. This is one morning at Chamvera, African barred owl. Uh, Owlet, Jim Brown will remember this bird. Yeah. And spotted eagle owl. Bump into this sporadically on this trip. A lot of the action here was going to be done on the water. Uh, here's greater swamp warbler and water thick knee. It's pretty common here. And uh, this is a Pratt and Cole, colored plat, uh, Pratt and Cole. It's kind of a, a shorebird. An African snipe. Waddled lapwing. What a cool looking plover. And this is African skimmer, quite like our skimmer. And they nest on these banks. Here's a little bee eater and white fronted bee eater. These are like uh, kingfisher relatives. And the real star of the show for the August trips would be Southern Carmine bee eaters. Uh, they're colonial nesters and nest in the banks of the um, Kavango River. You see these nest holes, just a beautiful bird. And they come in, um, they're migrants come down in, uh, in August. So we, we leave Shamvura, we, uh, we're on our way to the border. We stop at a, a place called Mahango. It's a national park that you can actually get out of your car in and bump into this uh, ostrich and with many babies and the male takes care of the babies. It's pretty wild. There must've been 30, 30 there. And Cape Buffalo, wow. That's the best place to see them on this trip. And roan antelope, sable antelope, vervet monkey, and of course, baboons. So lots of things to see at Mahango. We usually stretch that out to about close to five. I think the border closes at 5.30. So we hightail it over there. There's one guy behind the counter. You hand him your paperwork and he goes, okay, you can go. And then you just, you can walk across the border yourself. Really sleepy little border. Into Botswana the next morning. Sunrise, I remember Jim Brown helping me figure out how to take a sunrise picture. <laughs> this is through my scope. Um, so we are now in Botswana. Just uh, most of what we're gonna do here is we're gonna be on the water uh, for a good part of it. Again, it's the Okavanga River world's greatest oasis, a little dugout canoe, locals. There's um, golden breasted bunting and <clears throat> coppery tailed kukul. This is a really large kukul, kind of the size of a large loaf of bread. And the kingfishers, this uh, pied kingfisher, giant kingfisher, scarfing down some kind of a crab and Malachite Kingfisher, a little tiny job. And here's Guy Smiley here, this uh, Nile Crocodile, always seems to be smiling. Last trip we had, we had one that the largest one I've ever seen, it had to have been, you know, maybe 12, 14 feet. And we got fairly close to it in the boat and damned if that thing didn't 
move as quicker than I, you would ever imagine. And everybody practically fell out of the boat. That was <laughs> frightening. He didn't like us getting that close. And here's the benign looking uh, hippo, hippopotamus, uh, one of the more dangerous animals in the river. And I think um, one of these guys went under our boat and I don't, I think it was, it could have been 2010 or 2011 and it was pretty freaky um, and dangerous. And in fact, the guy who was driving the boat that I was in that, that it went under it was 2010. Um, he got fired as a result of it for getting that close and allowing the thing to go underneath. And um, someone said he was seen hitching after he got fired, you know, back home. Uh, this is one that uh, I don't think you guys in 2010 saw. Uh, but we bumped into every once in a while, we would get a uh, Southern ground hornbill, uh, uh, kind of a terrestrial hornbill, bizarre looking. African green parrot, Myers parrot, or did I say African green pigeon, I should say, and Myers parrot. And there's African fish eagle, just kind of somewhat similar to American bald eagle but with the white chest and African Jacana. It was a rarity. Uh, Alan's Gallinule ran into that one or two times on, on these trips. And this is another really rare one, white back Terran. Not sure if you guys got that one or not. Really skulky, super nocturnal. Um, you could spend an hour just staring at a tangle trying to get a piece of that bird. So, it's not the great picture, but not too shabby, depending on uh, um, seeing on how hard we work to get it. And here's um, Little Bittern. And this is Goliath Heron. Wow, what a spectacular Heron. Storks, this is Yellow-billed Stork. And African open build stork and saddle build stork, a real looker with that chest with a little red spot. And marabou stork, not much of a looker. <laughs> uh, pretty gritty, in fact. Um, a big target uh, for our Botswana stay is a very immense Pell's fishing owl. And we were lucky on several trips to see that. That's a real big target. That's another look. And then we're winding down. This is spur winged goose, some in flight and, and a wet marsh. We're just about to finish here and birds are starting to get bored. <laughs> Mammals are getting tired. People at home on the Zoom are nodding out. But we hope you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you, those of you who have not been, um, give Namibia and Botswana a try. And we not only hope, we pray that you go. <laughs> um, and this is the whole last trip that we, uh, we're on. And uh, here's Ken and Charlie, the aforementioned. Uh, there's Andrea and David. I don't think anyone. Oh, of course, Janet. 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 Martin? Oh, no, no Margie wasn't. He was on the first oh, yeah. one. So anyway. Angela. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Here, here. And would you guys want to ask me any questions? Oh, what do I got to do? Uh, stop and share or something like that? Stop sharing, yes. All right, stop sharing. Okay. Any questions? So if you have any questions, you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. That was fabulous, Jerry. Really amazing pictures. Absolutely beautiful. 
Carl Harvey uh, here. Totally agree, Gina, with that, Gina. Thanks. It's amazing. Yeah. Jerry, they say that Namibia is the darkest place on the planet at night. Did you did you see spectacular uh, stars? Oh yeah, it's unbelievable. For an astronomer, it's just it's heaven, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, <laughs> no no ambient no ambient light uh, to deal yeah. with. Yeah, it's, it's spectacular. Yeah. Jerry, yeah. this is Jana. I Hi, remember Jana. when we when we were at the Wilderness Lodge. Yep. Um, it was, I think it was a moonless night and I got up in the middle of the night and I could not see a thing inside our tent that we were in. And I went out to look at this. It was so pitch black. It was just unbelievable. Uh, and stars were just, I mean, that memory has stayed with me for hmm. all the, I mean, all these years. It's just incredible. Do you agree that like practically everyone on your trip and any, anyone else who's done this trip, Nobody wants to leave that place. I mean, oh, it's just. I mean, it just looking at these brought back so many memories because I remember mm. every place you just we passed through. I I have very immaculate memories of everything. It was just yeah. wonderful. Yeah, luckily, um, Itosha was the uh, immediately after Irango, so people would forget about it really quick. <laughs> Oh. oh, I remember everything in the, was it um, where the, uh, the women sang to us? Oh, right, right. The, uh, basically all, singing. the whole staff, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was, um, I believe uh, I got up and did a jig with them. Yeah, you did. <laughs> 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 it, it amazes me how clear it is in my memory. So thank mm. you so much. Uh, here, Air and Namibia went out of business this year. They had to fold up shop. Yeah. So did oh. South African Air. South African Air. Oh, They've got um, uh, $4,000 of ours. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Namibia, I, I had, I had $7,500 on a trip to Namibia that I was supposed to go last August that I'm, I'm not going to see back either, I don't think. No, but nobody's, it's just so tough out there. Yeah. And you got to feel for these, you know, guys in the travel industry, like Gina. Yeah. That's, uh, man, it's the toughest. Maybe, if you want to go uh, from Deborah, yeah. would you repeat the names of the guides in their podcast? Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's Charlie Hess and Ken Barron's. And the podcast is, um, what's it? Naturally Adventurous. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, actually, uh, Julian Huff was just on the latest one. And um, I don't know how they knew each other, but Julian is a Brit uh, transplant to Connecticut, um, just a fantastic birder. And he's been all over the world and he's a, quite the storyteller. So he had, um, I think it'll be featured in, um, in at least a couple episodes. But it's great listening, really, really fun. Another question is, is there a next trip in the planning? Oh, we have uh, not, not this close, but we're, we're going to South Africa. Um, well, we were supposed to go in, uh, what was it, August? Yeah, and now it's uh, August of 22. Uh, we have a whole bunch of things right. planned, uh, but we've, we've shoved everything out to 22. Uh, basically, we've got a Mexico, Panama, Galapagos, um, South Africa, and a couple of Australias. Would you do Namibia and Botswana again? I would do Namibia and Botswana again, but yeah. every time I contact them and they're going, they say, oh no. Not that again. <laughs> but I like it. People like it. I'd like to go back. Yeah, quite a few people have, have put that at the top of their, you know, like favorite trips. And I, I've heard that often. And I can see why. It's a, a photographer's dream. Oh, my God. You know, I don't know anything about photography. I don't know, uh, you know, an F-stop from a G-clef to whatever, you know. I just... If you can't take pictures there, you should not be owning a camera. <laughs> the phone will do it. Yeah. Uh, another question from Eva. Uh, 
from Evan. No photos of a honey badger? Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, I was explaining to um, Dennis earlier. I've got, I, I use a Mac and I don't use Photoshop. I just use the regular iPhoto. And we upgraded our system and I lost iPhoto. And so all my stuff is in the cloud and I never bothered to name stuff, you know, so I just have image 9472, you know, <laughs> and I have no idea what it is. And so it's incredibly tedious to find anything. It's just like a mind numbing, but yeah, honey badger we had on Evan's trip. Uh, that's, um, that was pretty incredible. I think we had it twice and, um, that's a rare one to see an, an impressive animal and a very funny video that uh, Charlie and Ken uh, turned us on to um, honey badger. Don't take no shit, et cetera. <laughs> that's, funny. that's what this shirt says. <laughs> it's history. Yeah. Yeah, the, the birds were, this is Jana again. Yeah. The birds were wonderful, but seeing all that, the great African wildlife was also extraordinary. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, I always I, I tell people that uh, when they come into the shop and say, "Oh, I'm going on a safari," and um, and I, I'll say, "Well, just make sure you tell the whoever's you're booking with that you're uh, crazy for birds, because everybody knows the fifty mammals that you're going to see, um, but." not everybody knows the 400 birds that you can see. So it's a, it's a, a huge value added. Um, not that any of you guys need that advice. Nice. Yeah, and then the other interesting experience I've had since going in 2011, I went to Greece on Lesbos, uh, I think it might've been in 2012, or I don't remember exactly the year, but with a British birding group, I also, I have in-laws there, so. Yeah. And in Greece, during their migration season, we saw a number of the birds that I had seen in Africa. Oh, and, nice. You know, because they were migrating back to Europe. Yeah. And that was very interesting to me. Yeah, Gina Nickel is on with us, and um, she leads tours there. I know uh, she To does. Lesbos, yeah. Yeah. I know. My second home. <laughs> I love it there. Mm. Yeah, it's beautiful. We're going this fall, actually. I that's in, in Aristos. I lived there for a year. Fabulous. All right. I guess we can leave. Yeah. Any other questions? So, uh, sorry, Dan. I'm just asking. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, yes, not. Thank you very much. Thank it's great to much. see you all again. Thank you. That was uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Good Jerry. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. We loved it. Yeah. And uh, let me just I'll see you soon. April 13th, Tuesday, April 13th. Hi, Mary Jo. These needs with uh, Kim Stoner mm -hmm. from the Yag Station. So go to the website to register for that trip, for that uh, program. And uh, thank you, Jerry. And uh, thank you all for uh, being with us this evening. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, Dennis. Bye. Bye. Bye.